you will hear a telephone conversation between a man called Peter, who is calling about a used car, and a woman called Tina, who is selling the car. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this example will be played first. Hi, it's Peter speaking. I'm calling about the ad you put online for a used car. Sorry, what was your name again? Oh, sorry, it's Peter Smith. The man says his name is Peter Smith. So Peter Smith has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hi, it's Peter speaking. I'm calling about the ad you put online for a used car. Sorry, what was your name again? Oh, sorry. It's Peter Smith. Oh, hi. I'm Tina. Good to hear from you. So tell me, which car are you after? I'm interested in the sedan. The 2012 Toyota sedan? We have a few of those available right now. Let's see. Was it the Black Pearl one? Or maybe the Barcelona red one? Oh, yes. I saw the red one. But I don't really like red cars. The one I'm after is silver. Right, I see. OK. Well, what would you like to know? Well, it says in the ad that it's in good condition. What does that mean exactly? Well, the paint is original. There are almost no scratches or dents. It looks like a new car, in fact. There was a tiny scratch on the door, but we polished that right out for you. Oh, that's good. How's the engine? The engine? Oh, yes. Well, there haven't been any problems, and it's been serviced regularly. You know, oil changes, lubes, and so on. The previous owner was a very careful old lady, and she looked after it. It's only had the one driver. Oh, except that on the papers it says two owners, because her son took over the ownership when the old lady stopped driving. How about the tyres? Are they in good condition? I do a lot of driving on the open road. Well, they all passed the car safety test. You might need to replace the back ones in the next six months or so because they're a bit worn. But the owner had the front two replaced only a couple of months ago. So those ones are new. You won't need to replace them for ages. Oh, and it had new brake linings recently too. I have the garage receipts for all of those things. OK, that's good. And what extras does it have? Well, air conditioning, of course. And there's a nice stereo which plays CDs. Or you can use it with an MP3 player. Mm, what else? All the usuals. Power steering, central locking, ABS brakes. Oh, and it also has a tow bar. You can remove that and store it inside the car when you're not using it. Mm, what else? You know it's manual transmission, right? Yes, I don't want an automatic. And the tow bar sounds great. I need that for carrying my bike. OK, well, that all sounds very cool. And you're asking $25,000, is that right? No, no way. <laughs> I think you must have the wrong ad. This one is 30000 and we won't go lower than that. Hmm, I see. What's the mileage again? Most cars of that age would be around 80,000 kilometres, or even up to 120,000. But as I said, the old lady didn't drive much, so it's very low. Only 50,000. You won't get a better low mileage car than this one. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. OK, well, I'd like to come and see it if that's all right. Where do you live? I'm in the suburb of Pembrose. Do you know where that is? Sorry, can you say that again? I'll just check on my GPS. Yes, I'm in Pembrose at 352 Hunter Place. H U N T E R. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, that's OK. It's about 30 minutes' drive from here. No, that's no problem. So, when would you like to come? How about this evening? I could come at 5 pm. Oh, no, sorry, I forgot about my gym class. How about 6.30? Does that suit you? Look, sorry, I have someone else coming then. Can you make it a bit later? Say 7.30? Well, OK then. But that's getting a bit late really and it'll be dark by then, won't it? I'd really like to see the car in daylight if that's OK. Well then, how about 4-ish? Yes, that's good. OK, let's say 4.30pm. And I guess I'll just have to be late for the gym. I'm usually very punctual, so being late just once won't matter too much. Yes, fine. See you then. Oh, just in case there's a problem, what's your mobile number? Oh, of course. It's 09-367-8192. Um, ignore that. It's my landline. Of course, it makes more sense to give you my mobile. That's 045-352-7652. Got that? Excellent. See you later, Peter. Yes, sure. Bye, Tina. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. You'll hear part of a free class about safety around campus. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening. I'm Geoffrey Miller from the University of Nottingham Student Union. And in this week's free class, Carlos Garcia is going to tell us about safety around campus. Over to you, Carlos. Thank you, Geoffrey, and thank you all for your attendance today. Also, I'd like to thank the Student Union here at the University for organising this lecture. Well, I've been serving and protecting the City of Nottingham for over 20 years now as a member of the Police Department. Does anyone know what type of crime is the most prevalent on campus? I heard someone say drugs and alcohol. That actually isn't too much of an issue. Violence? Nope. Actually... The biggest thing we worry about here is theft. The nature of crime on Nottingham's campus is quite different from that of the surrounding areas. Crime rates across the East Midlands are very difficult to control. We'd like to see the rates stay the same for this calendar year, but it has been increasing steadily over the past three years. On campus, however, I'm happy to say that the overall crime rate has fallen this year. You wouldn't think so if you've seen the extremely exaggerated stories in the media. The media has done nothing but cause more concern about crime in our area. Even the crime shows you see today are a little bit far-fetched, but at least viewers know they're not real events. We'd really like to see more factual news articles out there so the public can have a rational sense of the safety level of our society.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, let's move on to what to do when you see a crime. Do not get involved, if at all possible, and do not draw too much attention to yourself by running away in a conspicuous manner. Though most likely, and hopefully, you will not have to experience this situation, if you are being mugged, please do not try to resist. Instead, be compliant and seek help after the incident. Like I said, though, it is highly unlikely that you will find yourself amidst a crime, but it is important to be prepared should it ever happen. We find that educating students and staff on the correct precautions to take is the best way to increase your safety. Just remember to be smart when you're out late at night and avoid any area or person that looks suspicious. I know it sounds obvious, but I cannot stress this enough. It's also not a bad idea to have your mobile phone with you at all times, but be careful. If you're chatting on your smartphone on your way home, you're a prime target for thieves. I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people have left work or the library after 10 p.m. to go home before? A lot of you, right? If you do have to go home late at night, please don't walk home alone. More often than not, there's someone there that will be walking the same direction as you at some point. Walk home with a friend or co-worker, even if you must use your phone to call someone that's nearby to walk with you. It's always safer to walk home with someone. So when you're walking home, you may feel more comfortable with some sort of self-defense, such as pepper spray. Now. It's your call whether you want to carry something like this or not. However, I absolutely advise against carrying a knife or any other offensive weapon. All too often, they can be used against you if you're disarmed, putting yourself in more danger. For all those interested, the Recreation Center offers a free self-defense class to all students every Thursday evening. While obviously an introductory self-defense class may not equip you to fight off villains like a regular superhero, it does come in handy sometimes. After taking a self-defense class, you'll surely be more aware of possible dangers and how to deal with them. So hopefully now you have a more complete understanding of the nature of crimes committed on your campus and how to avoid being a victim. I know most students at the University of Nottingham are not the criminal types, but remember that there is no barrier like a wall or something keeping non-students out. There's no army force securing the borders, and I doubt anyone wants it that way. The campus is generally a safe place but it's not immune to small crimes once in a while. All right, that's all I have to say for today. Stay safe. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test 3. Section 3. You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. 
Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes,、yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes, but I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course.、Mm. So science and ethics. There's a lot of reading and research to do, and I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh. Oh, I see. We have to do assignments, and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports, you know, organizing them and using the right kind of language.、Mm. Might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh, I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do.、Mm-hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future, but apparently they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point.、Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. <laughs> Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that, because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing.、Mm. So it's got a very practical application.、Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have thirty seconds to read questions twenty-four to thirty. So let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh goodness! If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh no, that's not fair.、Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No, this maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. So we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Ah,、oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University. Oh, <laughs> mind you, the one on this course should make sense because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge, and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January, and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not.、Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have, like what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, okay. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it.、Oh, I think you'll be okay. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. No,、oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh, I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary though. <laughs> well. It shouldn't be too bad, 
as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um... Ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. Okay. Section 4. You will hear a lecture on time. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The subject of this series of lectures is horology, the science of measuring time, and we'll be looking at a few basic concepts in this lecture. The measurement of time has come a long way since ancient times. It began with such devices as the sundial, where the position of the sun's shadow marked the hour. Daylight was divided into twelve temporary hours. These temporary hours were longer in the summer and shorter in the winter, simply because the amount of daylight changes with the seasons. The earliest sundial we know comes from Egypt. It was made of stone and is thought to date from 1500 BC. Sundials were used throughout the classical world and, with time, evolved into more elaborate devices that could take into account seasonal changes and geographical positioning, and reflect the hours accurately, no matter what the time of year. This was quite an achievement in technology. Today, sundials can be seen as decorative pieces in many gardens. In the 11th century, the Chinese invented the first mechanical clocks. They were large and expensive, and certainly not intended for individuals. However, this is the type of clock we are familiar with today. There have been many developments in clocks and watches since then, and they have been greatly improved. But if your clock or watch makes a ticking sound, then it could well be based on the mechanical movements the Chinese developed a thousand years ago. However, timekeeping has moved on from the mechanical clock. Time has become so important that there is a series of atomic clocks around the world which measure international atomic time. Even though many countries have their own calendars, globalization has made it essential that we measure time uniformly. That we know, for example, that when, that when it's 6 a.m. in the United Kingdom, it's 2 p.m. in Beijing. This standard was set in 1958. Now these atomic clocks are situated in over 70 laboratories all over the world. There is so much to cover about the development of time measurement that I would like to refer you to the reading list. The core text is The Development of Time, Theory and Practice, but there are many other useful texts. A good grounding in the subject is given in Understanding Time by J. R. Beale. Although some sections lack detailed analyses, it does offer a good foundation. Also, Time, Concepts and Conventions is quite a useful read. You might think from the title that it's about the philosophy of time, but this isn't the case. Rather, it gives a good description of how different countries have different approaches to time in terms of calendars and days. Lastly, The Story of Time by David Harris analyses time in great detail, and I would recommend this book if you are aiming to specialise in horology. Now, we're going to continue with an in-depth look at lunar and solar cycles. That is the end of the listening test. You now have half a minute to check your answers.